Well, we almost got a fresh audience today. <clears throat> Might as well preach the same sermon I preached last Sunday. I heard it went okay with this young preacher in a small country church. He preached such a good sermon that they invited him back the next Sunday. And then the next Sunday after that, it was, the sermon was just as good because it was the same sermon. And, and the church goes, well, they kind of scratch their heads. Well, if we still like him, uh, we'll invite him back the next week. So the third Sunday, they invited him back again. And, and the sermon was just as good because it was the same sermon. And, and they didn't have anybody for the, for, the, for the next week, you know, scheduled. So they just said, oh, well, we'll just bring him again. You know, what's the, what's the odds? What's the odds? He's going to preach the same sermon again. And that sermon was just as good because you guessed it. It was the same sermon. And uh, this time the congregation kind of invited him back into the little meeting they had with them. And they, they, they got together and they says, hey, Pastor, you know, we've noticed that uh, you've preached to us the same sermon four times now. Is there, do you have any other sermons in your, you know, that you're going to preach to us. And, and the pastor didn't, didn't wince at all. He just said, well, you know, I preached that sermon, but once you guys do what I preached, I'll move on to the next sermon. <laughs> Please, let's turn to Jeremiah 42.3. You know, I've read Jeremiah so many times. And, uh, and even if I just read it once, Jeremiah is preaching over and over again the same sermon, it seems like. You know, we, we, we could, uh, Jeremiah is preaching the same sermon. Repent, surrender to Babylon, and thrive where God wants you, or die from sword, plague, and famine where you want to go. You know, this isn't just the fourth same sermon that Jeremiah preaches over and over again, but at least it's at least the fourth circumstance we're going to look at today of where he's, he's preached the same message. This last time we observe Jeremiah speaks again, and this time he doesn't get invited. They didn't want to hear from Jeremiah, but God says, I have a word for you, speak it. When Johanan was on his way to Egypt, he invited Jeremiah. He says, I want to hear from you. We want to know where we should go and what we should do. And they were on their journey to Egypt. And basically, they basically wanted Jeremiah to say, okay, you're on your journey to Egypt. It can't get any worse than this. Let's, let's just bless this journey. But uh, Jeremiah didn't say that. He says, you've got to turn back. You gotta re you, 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 I know you packed your bags for Egypt, but in order for you guys to prosper, in order for God to bless you, you've got to go back to Judah. Because if you go to Egypt, it's going to be a mess. You're going to die from famine, you're going to die from plague, or the sword. And uh, there, was, there, was, there was the truth. Jeremiah laid it out. And they heard that message from Jeremiah. They said they would do it. But instead of doing what Jeremiah says, they says, ah, we'll go to Egypt. We'll go to Egypt. You know, as I'm contemplating this, I'm wondering why I'm a little bit reluctant to go through Jeremiah again. Again. See, Jeremiah is speaking to me too. And over and over again, as I read this, I says, God... And, 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 and when we read this Bible, we're basically saying to, to, to ourselves, or we're saying to God, it says, God, tell me what you want me to do and where you want me to go. And I read this Jeremiah, and, and over and over again, God says, it's time to repent. It's time to turn things over. I'm wondering if I'm like those Israelites or if I'm like that church that opens up God's word but doesn't respond with obedience. One of the last verses we read last week was Jeremiah 42.3. Pray that the Lord your God will tell us where we should go and what we should do. You know, when I come to this word, for me, there are questions that I ask. I says, God, where am I going to go? Where should I go? Or where should I, what should I do? And please keep your place in Jeremiah, and we're going to turn to Galatians 6, 7. And we looked at this verse last week. I, like I said, it's going to be the same sermon, <laughs> basically. Jehonan asked this of Jeremiah, and then did not go where he should go. 
and do what he should do. You know, maybe Jehonan was thinking this time he was wrong. You know, how many times, how many times can you roll a double six, right? How many of you guys have played Yahtzee, right? Okay. You play Yahtzee, a Yahtzee of sixes. You know, this is what happened with Jeremiah. I mean, Jeremiah would say, hey, Babylon's going to come and take captive a portion of, of, of Jerusalem. And it happens. And then there's all kinds of prophets saying, hey, no, they're going to come back. Everything's going to be restored. And Jeremiah says, no. And, and, uh, and you, prophet, that's saying this, you're going to die within a year because you're a false prophet. And he dies. And, and, he, and, and Jeremiah just keeps rolling these yachts of sixes. And you know, how long can that last, right? God keeps doing it over and over again. He's right 100% of the time. Past, present, and future. And sometimes we think, I think in my head, oh, maybe I'm right. I'm going to go my own way instead of God's way. We have a history of 6,000 years with God being right 100% of the time. And sometimes we live like we're betting against the odds. Jehonan wanted his decision basically to be blessed. God, you know, Jeremiah, just, just, just say, you know, go to Egypt. Just, just say that. And Jeremiah did it. And Johanna says, well, I'll go with my chances. I'll go with the odds or against the odds. We'll reread another passage we read last week again in Galatians 6, 7. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. And we, we, we read that out of, out of our passage this morning, out of Colossians, what was it, 2 or 4? 2. 2. Don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. God cannot be ma- mocked. A man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please his sinful nature from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have the opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Let's, let's turn to James 1.12. Uh, you know, Jeremiah was dealing with the Israelites who were sowing seeds to the flesh. I mean, every time Jeremiah says, do this, don't do this, repent, and plant something good, do something good. And the Israelites would always say, okay, no, we're not going to do what you say. They'd been sowing seeds for a while. And they couldn't make the connections with the seeds of the flesh and take some time, that they take some time to mature and reveal the negative crop. And also, you know, we, we, we can, it goes two ways. When we sow to the spirit, it takes some time for the good crop to, to do it. That's why it says, don't be weary in doing good. Don't get tired of doing good because you're going to reap a harvest if you don't, if you don't stop. This, but also, we're also going to reap a harvest if we sow to the flesh. Like I mentioned last week, after the weeds are established, you can't go sow good seeds without first turning over the soil and clearing out the weeds first. Repentance is turning from one direction to the other. Then, by God's mercy and grace, he cleans out the sin and, and, and plants the good works into that good soil. Repentance, redemption, and regeneration. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You know, these three steps... These three steps are repeated all over in scriptures. In Jeremiah, it's in the prophets, it's in the Psalms, it's in in the Gospels, it's in the epistles. It's all over. I was was, uh, reading something this week, and it said, uh, it was the passage, or reminded myself, I says, no one can come to the Son unless the Father draws him. And this is one of the questions I'm going to ask at, at youth group tonight. No one can come to the Son unless the Father draws him. And, and, it, and it connected. Because there's where it starts. 
we see the Father and we look at his holiness and then we see our unholiness, our unrighteousness before him. And what does, what does, the, what does the law do? It brings us to Christ. What did John the Baptist do? He had a ministry. He had a baptism of repentance. Repentance. John prepared the way of the Lord. And I'm going, whoa! I never connected that, that passage, that verse, unless the Father draws him. I always thought this was, this was like the election. Okay, uh, I choose you, I choose you, I choose you. No, but really, God's perfection, God's holiness, God's law, and his standard for us is what draws us to Christ. Does that make kind of sense? He, repentance leads us to the cross. Jesus redeems us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. And, and, and the cross is where we trade our unrighteousness for his righteousness. But he doesn't stop there, you know. Though our sins be as red as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. You know, he doesn't just say, okay, I wiped all that nasty stuff off your life. You're now clean. You're you're." before me. Because when we plow a field, we just don't keep plowing it and plowing it and plowing it over and over again and say, ah, oh, I'm clean. No. We plant in that field. And so through, through, through Jesus, we die. We're buried with Christ. We're like planting ourselves. And then the Holy Spirit gives us new life and we get a new life in him. And that's the abundant life. That's salvation. You know, so many people think, and there, there's... I'm, I'm going to get ahead of myself, so I better, better slow down here. We could, there's, there are good deeds that we do in the grace and the power of the Holy Spirit that will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Salvation is so much more than just a change in address. Salvation is so much more than just a change in address. And sometimes we just look at this evangelism. Just, just say the prayer. You know, take on Jesus' righteousness. Wipe your slate clean. Though your sins be as red as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. And we stop there. Woohoo! They're going to be in heaven. But what about that abundant life that Christ promises us? Why don't we jump on the board and, and, and go through the repentance, the bearing of ourselves? And, you know, we don't just want to have this empty field that's all nice and plowed and, and dirt because pretty soon something's going to grow in there. Either that or that soil's just going to blow away with the next wind. Paul didn't want the church to be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. God is right 100% of the time. It was true for the Israelites. The seeds of the flesh they had sown. It took a while, but they were finally heading out. In James 12, it, it kind of reverses the, the order of Galatians, Galatians 6. Um, and it starts out with, if we're persevering. Jeremiah persevered. But it was contrasted to the sowing of the Israelites. In verse 12 it says, Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial because he has stood the test. He will receive the crown of life that the God has promised to those who love him. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But he... Each one is tempted when, by his own evil desires, he is dragged away and enticed. Then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. The fruit of the flesh, when it heads out, when it fits fully mature, it gives birth to death. It's a final result. Also, the final result of sowing to the Spirit. What's that? It's the crown of the opposite of death. A crown of life. It's a crown of life. Verse 16, continuing on. Do not, or don't be deceived. There's that word again. Don't be deceived. My dear brothers, every good and perfect gift is from above. Coming down from the Father of 
the heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. My dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. For a man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. There's there in verse 21. It got to all three. Okay? Get rid of the moral filth. Turn it over. Repent. Get it over with. And then... Get this word planted in you, which can save you. And I'm, and I'm talking, this salvation is not just a salvation to change an address. This is salvation for your life. He gives you new life. Repent, plant, and grow. Turn your life to God in fear. Be buried with Christ in death and raised to new life in the spirit. Verse 22, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself. There's that word deceive again. Okay, I go to church, I, I, I do good things and, and all that stuff, but don't just merely listen to the word, so deceive yourself, do what it says. Anyone who listens to the world but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives what? Freedom. And continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. Let's, let's go back to Jeremiah, go, going back to Jeremiah 12, 13. You know, don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. It appears twice in this, this passage. And apparently that's what's been happening to Judah. But wait. You know, they may have some grounds for thinking, you know, all oh, this God thing, it just doesn't work. You know, we tried that. We did the sacrifices. We, we, we stopped doing some of this stuff. You know, even, the, even Jeremiah talks about this in, in a commentary, clear back in, in, in Jeremiah 12, 13. He says, they will sow wheat, wheat, but reap thorns. They will sow wheat, but reap thorns. They will wear themselves out, but gain nothing. So bear the shame of your harvest because the Lord's fierce anger. And we're going to go to Jeremiah 44. And who can blame them? You know, we tried that. You know, we, we did the things that you said, Jeremiah. We, we, we got rid of our slaves. Remember that passage where the, Jeremiah says, get rid of all your slaves. And so, so they, they says, okay, we got rid of our slaves. You know, that lasted about a week. And then they got them all back, you know. <laughs> but, did, you know, it was still bad. It lasted a week, repentance. You know, it's, it's kind of like those diets. You get on a diet, woohoo, I'm on a diet, you know. And, and, and you're on it for a week, and man, I didn't lose any weight. You know, I'm still chunky or whatever. You, you know what I'm saying? Uh, you got to you gotta go through, and, and, and like, like we, will, we will reap a harvest if we don't stop. We got to stay with the game. We got to stay with it. So here they, here they are. They're sowing these good seeds and they're reaping thorns. Why? Anybody understand why? There was no repentance. There was no repentance. Some people want the benefits of God. You know, they, 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 they like, hey, where's that peace that passes understanding? Where's that joy unspeakable and full of glory? Man, I, I, I want to have that abundant life. Some people want the benefits of God, but don't want God in his wholeness. Jesus says to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You know, sowing a few wheat seeds over a crop that's already established in weeds isn't going to amount to anything. Don't be deceived. Having pure thoughts after, you know, after sowing seeds of immorality isn't going to go and bring a righteous crop. You're not going to have the benefits of, of being one of planting and sowing God's word in your life and doing what he says. Jeremiah preached too many of these same sermons to be invited back. And so, like I said, um, 
Jeremiah, on this last one, God says, I have a message for you. One more message for this people in, in Judah in, while they're living in, in Egypt. But this time, Jeremiah goes to them, the real reason comes out. The people finally disclosed the intentions they had all along. In Jeremiah 44, 1, this word came to Jeremiah concerning all the Jews living in lower Egypt, at Migdal, Taphanes, and Memphis, and in upper Egypt. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Okay, Jeremiah says, okay, here it is. You saw the great disaster I brought on Jerusalem and all the towns of Judah. Today they lie deserted and in ruins. Because of the evil they have done, they provoked me to anger by burning incense and by worshiping other gods that neither they nor your fathers have ever known. Again and again, I sent my servants, the prophets, who said, do not do this detestable thing that I hate. But they did not listen or pay attention. They did not turn from their wicked ways or stop burning incense to other gods. Is there still time for these people? You know, I, I think... There is, or God wouldn't say, hey, Jeremiah, hey, I got a message for these people. There's still time. There's always time to stop the weeds from maturing. And, and of course, when they finally mature, you know, it brings death, right? Until death, until they mature, it's not too late. In, in Washington, where, where they have the Palouse, there's an average dry land wheat yield of over 80 bushels an acre. That's average, okay? Crazy. Some record wheat yields of 150 bushels on dry land, okay? Whitman County in Washington averages 83 bushels an acre, and Lataw County of Idaho averages 82 bushels an acre. Okay, anyways, the land is good, but just because the land is good, doesn't mean the crop is. Anyways, there, there, was, there was a farmer over there. And this, is, this, is, this, is, this is one of the, the stories that you hear over there. There was a farmer over there that, that all around him was beautiful wheat crops. And in his wheat field, he had those thistles growing. And uh, over and over again, the, the farmers, the local farmers around him says, get rid of those thistles. You got, you got thistles in your field, spray them, do something. You know, when they, when they were really young. And as they were growing, as they were getting older, he says, do something. You know, go in there and just hack them. All you got to do is go through your field and just hack them off. Stop those thistles from growing, please. And then pretty soon the thistles were blooming. And the farmer says, do something. You've got to mow them down. Do something. Plow them under. Do something. Get rid of them. Because these thistles, man, their root systems go low. They suck all the, the moisture out of the, out of the ground. And, and it ruins the harvest. And not only that, when they bloom, their seeds spread like crazy for miles around. Nag, nag, nag. They kept hearing the same thing. The farmer kept hearing the same, the same thing. Stop. Turn those things over. Destroy those things. And then one night it happened. His field went up in smoke. I don't know why. <laughs> but Jeremiah was right at that point with these people from Judah. There was still hope. As long as we have breath, there is still time to repent and destroy the crop of flesh and avoid the complete destruction, death, and flames of the maturing sin. Sin's roots were deep. In Jeremiah 44, 9, Jeremiah continues with this nag nag. Uh, have you forgotten the wickedness committed by your fathers and by the kings and the queens of Judah and the wickedness committed by you and your wives in the land of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem? To this day they have not humbled themselves or sworn or shown reverence, nor have they followed my law and decrees I set before you and your fathers. Therefore, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says, I am determined to bring disaster on you and destroy all Judah. I will 
take away the remnant of Judah who were determined to go to Egypt to settle there. They will all perish in Egypt. They will fall by the sword and die from famine. From the least to the greatest, they will all die by the sword and famine. They will become an object of cursing and horror, of condemnation and reproach. I will punish those who live in Egypt with the sword, famine, and plague, and I will punish Jerusalem. None of the remnant of Judah who have gone to live in Egypt will escape or survive to return to the land of Judah, to which they long to return and live. None will return except for a few fugitives. You know, blah, blah, blah. Sounds familiar, right? In verse 15, then all the men who knew that their wives were burning incense to other gods, along with all the women who were present, a large assembly, and all the people living in lower and upper Egypt said to Jeremiah, we will not listen to the message you have spoken to do to us in the name of the Lord. The truth comes out. In verse 17, they continue, we will certainly do everything we said we would. We will burn incense to the queen of heaven and pour our drink offerings to her as we and our fathers, our kings and our officials did in the towns of Judah in the streets of Jerusalem. At that time, we had plenty of food and were well off and suffered no harm. But ever since we stopped burning incense to the queen of heaven and pouring out drink offerings to her, we have had nothing and have been perishing by sword and famine. The women added, when we burned incense to the queen of heaven and poured out drink offerings to her, did not our husbands know that we were making cakes like her image and pouring out drink offerings to her? Then Jeremiah said to all the people, both men and women who were answering him, did not the Lord remember and think about the incense burned in the towns of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem by you and your fathers, your kings and your officials and your people of the land? When the Lord could no longer endure your wicked actions and detestable things you did, your land became an object of cursing and a desolate waste without inhabitants as it is today. And going down to verse 26, but hear the word of the Lord, all the Jews living in Egypt. I swear by my great name, says the Lord, that no one from Judah living anywhere in Egypt will ever again invoke my name or swear as surely as the Lord lives. For I am watching over them for harm and not for good. Well, that, that doesn't sound like Jeremiah 29, 11, does it? I'm watching over them for harm and not for good. The Jews in Egypt will perish by the sword and famine until they are all destroyed. Those who escape the sword and return to the land of Judah from Egypt will be very few. Then the whole remnant of Judah who came to live in Egypt will know whose word will stand, mine or theirs. You know, we live in a culture that's betting against the odds. Are we betting against the odds? What are the raisin cakes that we bake? You know, what are the things that, you know, God, I don't think I'm going to give that up. What are the images we form? What are the gods we serve? I don't want to be deceived. I came across this verse in John 10.10. 10. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. And he's a deceiver. When he opens his mouth, he lies. Jesus, when he opens his mouth, he tells the truth. And he says, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. There's a promise for us. And it doesn't matter where we are. As we have breath, he has a message for us. Are we willing to surrender? Turn our life over to him. And let him plant in our lives as we die to ourselves and live to the Holy Spirit. Thankfully, God stands by his entire word. Through the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we can go from fear... To relief to abundant life let's pray Lord we come to you today and Lord there's so much in your word and Lord even though you know sometimes we we hear it and we go man I don't I don't want to hear this I don't want to keep hearing the same thing over and over and over again Lord these words aren't written for us to get bored 
These words aren't written for us to, to detract from life. But they're to save us. And not only save us from the destructive pattern that we've lived. And not only to save us from our own sins and our own way we've planted from heading out to death. But to plant in us a new and abundant life. Full of glory and joy unspeakable. Full of peace that passes understanding. That not as the world gives, but as you give. And Lord, though the world doesn't understand it, when we follow you and, and do as you say, we come to understand who you are and that you are a wonderful, loving God. Lord, help those that, 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 that hear your word. Let it sink in. More than just in our, in our cranium, but Lord, let it flow out into what we do with our hands and where we walk with our feet. And Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.